It's time for the Phil Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. I am finally back from my little trip to Italy. Spent about four weeks there, and I want to make sure I don't call it a vacation. I do call it a trip because I worked while I was in Italy. So not really a vacation, although it kind of felt like a vacation sometimes. But I would set aside full days here and there to, to do work, and sometimes that was 8 or 12 hours. And then sometimes we had a couple hours on the train and I would do uh, work from, from the train and on my laptop, tablet, I guess it's a tablet, and on the phone and answering emails when we had uh, things to wait. And at one time we were on a, on a boat on Lake Como and I was responding to emails. So I was able to get about 90% of everything I could get done from my home office while not being in my home office. Uh, so I have this cute little device called a Glocal Me, uh, and I bought data uh, on a SIM card or a SIM card to hook up with data from a local internet provider, our cell phone provider. And so it went through the cell phone systems through this device. So hopefully it's very secure and able to get m- the vast majority of my work done while also being able to see sites. So uh, if you're interested in those pictures from that, uh, you can see a lot of that on my Facebook page. Of course, it's just Phil Ferguson. Uh, and I might share a few stories here about it. Uh, but for the most part, like 95, 98% of everything went wonderfully well. Of course, stories about things going wonderfully well aren't as fun as the occasional story of something that went wrong. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one of the things that went crazy. We had this all-day trip uh, to the cities of Orvieto, and Assisi, uh, two hilltop, mountaintop cities uh, in the country of Italy, and we'd left from Rome, and these cities aren't really that close to Rome, so it, it's a good journey, and it's supposed to be a full day trip, uh, about 12 hours, and this is an example of how things can go wrong, and it's a fun story, so I like telling it, but I don't want you to get the impression that my envi- entire trip sucked, it was just this one thing. <laughs> and my wife and I have been on probably a dozen different uh, trips like this, either half day or full day uh, throughout Europe. And every single time I've written a review, it's been a five star review. This one we gave one star and only because I couldn't give less. So it started from the very beginning, a, a, a couple of days before the uh, trip was supposed to start. We were already in Rome and I called them to confirm that it was still on and it wasn't canceled and everything was going great. And they said, yes. And I said, you're still going to pick me up at my address. Here it is. And they said, uh, we don't have uh, that as being a hotel. Where are you staying? And I said, well, we have an apartment. And they said, oh, sorry, we can only pick up from a hotel. And I said, okay, well, there's a hotel next to me. I'll, I'll go to that address and you can pick me up there. And they said, well, you're not staying at that hotel. I said, that's correct. I just told you I'm in an apartment. I'm not staying at the hotel, but you said you have to pick me up at a hotel. I'll, I'll go next door to the hotel. And they said, no, we can't do that. I said, so where do you want to pick me up? We can't pick you up. You're not at a hotel. Okay, well, that was a bit of a shock because when I put in the address, when I registered, it said, we will pick you up at this address. Now they're telling me, no, we are not going to pick you up, even though that's part of the program. You have to come to the meeting point on the other side of Rome. Not a huge big deal. So, you know, that in and of itself, okay, a little miscommunication, a little misunderstanding. I think it's kind of petty to not pick me up from an address that's not a hotel. And, and we were next to a hotel. And matter of fact, our apartment was half a block, maybe oh, a full block from the Coliseum. So we were in central Rome. It wasn't like we were out in a suburban setting. So we got on the metro and rode to the place we had to meet them. And, you know, we, we got to everybody else and we started our trip. 
And we booked this trip as an English tour. Uh, my Italian is not quite good enough to have someone talk to me all all day in Italian and, and point out uh, specific details about architecture, art, churches, um, landscapes, and all this stuff, and, and for me to get it all in. So we got an English tour. Well, it turned out that this tour was English and Spanish. So I don't have a problem with anyone that speaks Spanish. I would love to learn Spanish. It's, it's all I can do to handle Italian on top of English, but uh, that's fine. But of course, it cuts in time uh, in half, one would assume, the, the amount of information the tour guide is going to give you in English because part of the time they're talking in Spanish, part of the time they're talking in English. Well, it turns out that our tour guide much more favored Spanish than English. So the bulk of the time she was talking in Spanish and only a part of the time, maybe 30% of the time, was she talking in English and her accent was really thick. She knew a really good vocabulary, but her pronunciation skills were not sufficient for the job that she was performing. And we're on a bus that actually was incredibly loud. And my wife and I, we actually sat literally right behind the tour guide. And so you've got this giant tour bus, coach bus, pullman is what they call it in Italian. And she's in the front seat and we're, my wife and I are in the second seat. And we still couldn't understand what she was saying being that close to her and with the microphone of the bus because the bus was incredibly loud. So those things were a problem. Uh, then we were on the bus for almost uh, two hours and we get to the city of Orvieto. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous city. But because it's a big day and a lot of driving, we found out, uh, we had less than an hour in the city of Orvieto. And we finally get to the top. Uh, the city's up on a hill or a mountain, depending on your definitions. They're like, okay, you have 45 minutes, go and come back to this meeting point. No local guide, no direction there. So we wandered the streets for a little bit. We took some gorgeous pictures of little side streets. We went to the edge of the city for the scenic overlook and took pictures out there. We went to the Duomo, the main cathedral in the city and had a really nice time for 45 minutes. Absolutely beautiful place. I would have loved to spend four hours, maybe a whole day seeing this town, but we had 45 minutes. We get back on the bus and we have to drive from Orvieto to Assisi. And because these two towns are far apart, the road between them is kind of the back way to go. Uh, it was not a very good road. And the bus was not a very good bus. There was uh, the part over your head where you could actually put luggage if you were you know, traveling with your suitcases. Uh, some of the connections had come loose and it rattled. And I actually thought for a while that maybe it was going to fall and crush my skull. So you can imagine that kind of takes away from the enjoyment of the bus ride. Uh, our lunch was at a place near a lake. And apparently near a lake includes three kilometers away. So we couldn't see the lake. We never did even drive by the lake, I don't think. Uh, and if we did, it was just a flash. There's the lake that we just ate by. And lunch was mediocre at best. So we weren't very happy with that. We get to the town of Assisi and they take the bus to the highest point of the city. And, and it, again, it's another mountaintop city and it, it's kind of built up one side of this mountain. So they go to the top and you walk downhill all the way back to where the bus is waiting for you at the bottom. And this did have a tour guide, which also spoke Spanish and English, which was nice. And she was really good. But we had something like 45 minutes to an hour to go all the way through the town. So whenever people wanted to stop and look at something, the tour guide have to keep saying something like, well, keep coming, keep going, keep going. We've got to get all the way through the city in a very short period of time. So the entire time was rushed. And we finally get to the main Duomo of this city. And you have 30 minutes of free time after they walk you through and tell you part of the Duomo, but there were still much more to see of this Duomo and the grounds. And so we took about 10 minutes seeing more of the Duomo. And then we had 10 more minutes to find our way to the bus and we didn't want to be late. So we ended up getting there five or six minutes early. So our 30 minutes of free time really was 10 extra minutes to walk around in the Duomo without a guide. So that was kind of annoying and on the way back, it's told to us, you know, when uh, we're about 30 minutes from Rome and 
now it's like eight o'clock at night. So this was a 13 hour journey. And of the 13 hours, I think, well, we had an hour for lunch, an hour, give or take in Orvieto and at most two hours in Assisi, we had four hours of not being on the bus. So the other nine hours, four plus nine, 13, yeah, nine hours was on the bus. So that's a lot of time on a bus. 30 minutes outside of Rome, we're told that the bus is going to make stops in different regions of Rome and you get off where it's kind of sort of close to your hotel, which I kind of assumed that since they didn't pick me up, they weren't going to drop me off and my wife and I were on our own. But this came as a big shock to people that got picked up at their hotels that they were not going to be dropped off at their hotels. Um, The bus driver and the tour guide often were on their phone taking care of personal business or arguing with family members. The bus driver drove through red lights twice. One time he was so late in braking that he had to drive into the oncoming traffic to not hit the car in front of him. We were not happy being on this bus, being on this bus for nine hours. And we were kind of thinking, where do we get off? Because she hadn't communicated anything to us about where we're going to get off, where we're going to go. And we're actually kind of considering whatever the first stop is, we're just, it's in Rome. We can get a cab. We can get a bus. We can hop on the Metro, wherever. I I don't know if I want to be on this bus anymore. Well, as we're pondering that, we get to the first stop. And they tell this lady who's, I don't know, 70, 75 years old, this is her stop. Now, since we started at seven in the morning and 13 hours have gone by, 13 hours plus, this is 830 in the evening. It's dark, like dark, dark, not like dusk, sunset. It, the sun's gone down. It's dark. And then they tell the 75 year old lady who, who needs a cane to walk, who has been walking for a couple hours, including an hour long stretch downhill, which can put different stresses on your leg muscles that you're not used to walking on flat ground. Boy, don't I know about that, that she now needs to get off and walk to her hotel. And she tells the guide and the bus driver that she doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know this area. This is not close to her hotel. And they said, it's only a few blocks away. This is as close as we can get you because of the bus. You have to get off now. She is very concerned, maybe even scared. And my wife and I said, okay, you know what? We are going to get off. We're going to take care of this lady that we've just spent the last 13 plus hours with. And so we got off the bus with her. We walked for two blocks and decided that we probably weren't going to be able to, she was not going to be able to walk all the way to her hotel. So we ended up going to a taxi stand because I'm, I understand in Rome, you can't just wave down a taxi. You have to go to certain points. So we had to figure out where the closest taxi stand was. And then we paid for a taxi cab to take us and her to her hotel. And we made sure we got out of the taxi and got her into her hotel. If she had been willing to walk down the 150, 200 steps of the Spanish steps area, she was really only six blocks from her hotel. But because she couldn't handle the stairs, it ended up being more like eight or nine blocks. And thankfully, more than half that trip was in a cab that we paid for. And so by the time we got to the hotel, because of the long day and even the stress of walking the extra blocks, she was on the verge of just breaking down in tears. And I I can't even imagine that this company does this. Apparently, they do this on a regular basis. It has hotel pickup. I assume, I think everybody else on the bus assumed If you have hotel pickup, you have hotel drop off that someone takes you back to your hotel and not that after a long day, you're going to walk 15, 20, 30 minutes to get back to your own hotel. So there were other details and I I didn't even want to rant about this as long as I did, but that was just absolutely amazing. Um, We went to so many places like we talked about Orvieto and Assisi. We went to Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. We spent a good part of a week in Genova. Genoa in English. Uh, we spent two days in Cinque Terre. We went to Torino, Milano, spent three days in Lake Como, the, the city of Como, and on, on and around the lake, Lake Como. And we spent three days in Padova, and there was an Italian skeptic conference there, which which what inspired this whole thing that we, we spent three days at. And after that, we went to Rimini, 
and to the, the uh, I guess, the country of San Marino. And it's a little country completely surrounded by Italy. So that was pretty cool. And then, of course, you got to get back to Rome, or at least we did, uh, to catch our flight back. So I might talk about some of these other things, but uh, I'm posting pictures of each activity on my Facebook wall. So if you want to see pictures of Italy, and uh, uh, just this morning, I put up pictures from Orvieto, and uh, you can go check those out. If you have questions about what it's like to go to Italy, or if you've ever thought about going to Italy and you want some suggestions of how to get there or what to see, please feel free to contact me. Uh, Of course, if you have investment questions, same thing at the email is phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. And now I'm going to awkwardly segue into a uh, investing skeptically topic called future income payments. This investing skeptically segment is on future income payments. And I have to admit that I got notified about this first by one of the show listeners. And I regret I don't have the name. I'm not even sure if I still have the email. I actually probably still have the email because I save everything, but I just don't know who sent it to me. And I took a quick look at this and I thought, this is so confusing to me and so fucked up. I don't even know what I would say about it. And I have other topics to cover and other things to do and limited time to go dig into this. Thanks anyway for the great idea, but I don't know if I'll be able to get around to it. Well, more news has come out. And so I went back to the original link that I had saved and found some other links. And now I think I understand what it is. So I want to tell you about it because I I didn't want to go over it when I didn't understand it myself. And part of the reason I had a problem is because it sounded so inherently stupid on its face that, that I, I assumed, I assumed that I misunderstood. Well, it turns out it really is that bizarrely stupid. It's unfucking believable. So here's the deal. First of all, uh, in hindsight, uh, apparently people didn't know this in, in advance that the guy that set up this company called future income payments is a convicted felon, at least previously, and served actual jail time for fraud. So he set up a new company and convinced a lot of brokers and advisors to start selling his products. And so there's a couple of different moving parts to this. So first of all, what you need to find is someone that has a pension. And maybe the pension pays you out sixty grand a year, $5,000 a month. Nice, big, healthy pension. But for whatever reason, you don't want to wait to get all that money year after year after year. You might be happier getting two hundred dollars or $500,000 in advance right now today. So this company, Future, well, it Future Income Payments, would negotiate a rate or a flat amount to pay you, and then they have bought the right to your pension payments in the future. So they have to wait for the money. And you get the money today and you can do whatever you want to with it. Now, that doesn't sound so bad. It does turn out based on uh, the articles that I've read, including uh, one that is in the Wall Street Journal, which is kind of the first source of this. It's behind a paywall, but I found it from the link that was sent to me. uh, A a law firm, Ray Quinney and Nebuchadnezzar, Attorneys at Law website, And the title is called Another Scam Comes to Light, Future Income Payments, or FIP. So instead of you waiting for your $60,000 a year, they might give you $300,000 today, and they get to collect the payments for the next 10 years. And of course, it really helps if your payments are guaranteed for 10 years, say. So you might have a pension, because you can get a pension that pays just you as long as you're alive just you and your spouse or you and then a lower rate for your spouse if you die or you can have five years guaranteed or 10 years guaranteed or 20 years guaranteed and all this complication they go through all this future income payments and they figure out what this money would be worth considering the time value of money so they might get six hundred sixty thousand dollars a year for 10 years and instead of you waiting 10 years to get this they give you three hundred thousand dollars in cash today And it turns out that the amount of money they were giving people to buy the rights to their uh, future pensions was very, very 
poor. And people are not necessarily math savvy. So I look at that and I'm thinking, if I have pretty much a guaranteed $60,000 a year for the next 10 years, that's $600,000. Why? Why would I take $300,000 today? And someone might say, well, what if you have $300,000 and you need to pay off something? Okay, well, that could be, but I could get a loan for that $300,000 and with today's interest rates of a few percentage points and pay that off over 10 years. So I don't like this from the very beginning, but that's the first step that you have to understand. It, it starts with someone who has a pension, probably a guaranteed pension, and this company will give you cash today for the pension payments you don't receive in the future and they receive them. Okay. It's claimed by the Wall Street Journal article that this is illegal. I'm not an attorney, but that's the first step. Then the second step that this company would do is they would then sell the rights to other people to make the pension income that they just bought the rights to. So now they become kind of a middleman or a broker. And so you would invest money and let's say they would want you to invest maybe 500,000 and they would pay you out the $60,000 per year. And in that case, your payout would look like about 12% a year. So you put in 500,000. If you got 50 grand back, it'd be 10%. Obviously, if you get 60 grand back, something like 12%. So you could get 12% on your money. So they buy these future payments for 300,000 and they sell them for 500,000 and they clear 200 grand. And then they make the payments to you over time of $60,000 a year. And you think to yourself, well, this is great. Well, one of the things that you may not have realized is that when you give them this 500,000 and you get the $60,000 per year for 10 years, you don't get the $500,000 back at the end. You're not making a 12% dividend or yield. They're paying you back 12% of your own money every year. And it's your money and the money that they already bought from somebody else on the cheap. Clearly this starts to get kind of complicated. Well, what ended up happening is the company started to not make any of the payments at all. They collected the pension uh, money and were late on payments, were short on payments. The payments didn't come at all. And after a couple of years, people started hiring attorneys and the company files for bankruptcy and the money is gone. So you might have put in 500,000, assuming you're going to get 60 grand for 10 years or 600,000 which is not a 12% return. That means you made $100,000. You put in 500,000, you eventually get 600,000 out of it. Over 10 years, uh, that works out to maybe two or 3%. Well, you could have gotten that in bonds without all this risk, without really knowing what you're getting. But when your advisor recommends this to you, in some ways, and this scares even me, that people are, I guess, expecting that I'm going to recommend what's in their best interest. And that's my goal. But you know, you've got to double check. Well, here's something where maybe even the advisor didn't actually understand what they were selling because the commissions could be as high as 10%. So if you invest 500,000, not only can they promote it and tell you that you're going to get 60 grand a year, they get a nice juicy 10% commission of 50 grand for getting you to buy this. And it's one of these things that sometimes people have concerns with the fact that I get paid for what I do. And I do get paid. I get paid about 1% or less for larger accounts. So if you invest 500,000, I might make 5,000 that year. And I have to keep you happy and satisfied. And you have to stay a client year after year after year after year for me to keep making money. So there's this incentive for me to do something that's good for you. Of course, there's the actual legal responsibility that I am a fiduciary. Anyway, back to these things. So the advisors make these nice juicy commissions. The brokerage firms make nice juicy commissions. And the uh, future income payments company makes all this money. And then they collect the pensions and they don't pay out the pensions. And so not only do they get all this money up front from investors, but then they keep the payments. So they get paid twice on money that probably shouldn't be flowing through them 
ever in the first place. So it's a, a simply staggering, staggeringly bold scheme. And apparently now the uh, losses uh, are more than $100 million. Uh, there's several hundred or several thousand uh, investors that aren't going to get their money back. Uh, of course, the New York Times has a nice story about some couple that put in $80,000 on this and poof, the $80,000 is gone. So this is why you have to at least have a basic understanding of what you're investing. This is also one of the reasons why stick with simple things, stocks and bonds, stock and bond mutual funds, stocks and bonds index funds. And when people bring me other ideas and say, what do you think about this? The first thing that pops into my head is how does this compare with things that I already know and understand? Because if I don't know or understand some new thing, my go-to, my default is I'm not interested. You will have to convince me that what you're suggesting is better than the system that most educated long-term investors use. That's buying stocks and buying bonds. There's a system there. There's a system that I understand. There's still no guarantees and you can lose a lot of money investing in stocks, at least in the short term. But I think I understand that relationship and I understand those probabilities. So when someone tells me there's a better way to do all this, kind of like with religion, I'm at least agnostic uh, or saying, okay, you claim this. Now you've got to prove it to me. And time and time and time again, they prove not to be true. So I'm not saying there's not a better way to invest. I just don't know what it is because if there was a better way, I would use that for my own money. So this is just another example of something that was too good to be true because people were not happy making two or three or 4% in bonds. Uh, they weren't happy with the risk profile of stocks and they got sold a bill of goods. They got convinced that there was something that could pay them seven, 10, 12% dividend, which wasn't even a dividend. That's another thing is that the money you get paid is not necessarily a dividend. And I've seen this multiple times. Uh, it's also common with private placement REITs, uh, not a REIT real estate investment trust index fund. But if you buy an individual REIT, uh, you can get a higher payout. It might pay you 10% a year. Well, part of what they're paying you every year is part of your own money back. Not necessarily a problem if you understand that. So if you invest 100000 and they pay you 10000 a year and 5% of that is dividend and 5% of that is a reduction in your principal because they pay back part of your own money to you, one year later, your 100000 is 95000 because they had 5000 in dividends and then they paid 5000 of your own money back to you, it looks like you got paid 10%. You did. You got paid 10%. But part of the 10% was your own money being sent back to you. If that's what you want to do, that's not necessarily bad. But where the problem comes in is a lot of people think that the 10% is additional to the 100000 and the 100000 just stays there year after year after year. Well, what happens is five or six years later, you figure out you've only got fifty or sixty thousand dollars left. Where did my money go? Well, for us to pay out ten thousand, we have to keep paying you back more and more of your own cash. And you decide you don't want this investment anymore. Well, now you don't have a hundred thousand; you have fifty or sixty thousand. So take the time to in, to understand and investigate what is being suggested to you. If you do not understand it fully, don't invest in it. It's real simple. You can make money the old fashioned way. And often I've told people I give really boring investment advice, diversify, buy low, sell high, wait, it takes time to make money. So that's my little thing on future income payments. Another thing and a very, very long list of shit to avoid. Um, if you have questions, of course, email me, Phil at Polaris Financial Planning. And of course, of course, the, the, the performance that people first got to know you is a, was as Smeagol, you know, a uh, golem, Absolutely. you know, uh, uh, tremendous. Not only are you doing that, but you're doing two different characters, you might say, two different sides. I, I wonder if I could ask you a favor. Yes. Is that I, I have here, where do I have it? I have it right here. 
I would love it if I could hear either Smeagol or Gollum. Okay. Um, or well, both. Uh, read these tweets by Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> The fake news media has never been so wrong or so dirty. Purposely incorrect stories and phony sources to meet their agenda of hate. Sad. You can lose this one. Just, just that one if you don't mind. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Despite the constant negative press, kerfuffle. <laughs> wait, wait. Wait. What's kerfuffle, precious? No one knows. <laughs> That's the most beautiful thing. Right, everybody, welcome back. You are, of course, still listening to the Phil Ferguson Show, and with me now, I have the most dangerous woman in all of Tennessee, Gail Jordan. How are you, Gail? <laughs> I'm fine, Phil. I wasn't expecting that. I How know are... that's why I held that back. See, the listeners don't know we have a pre-show which has been deleted, so they can never hear it. <laughs> And I've been saving that, and I didn't tell you I was going to do that. So you're the most dangerous woman in Tennessee. Before we get to recovering from religion, you got to walk us through. What the heck is that all about? Well, that's what the lieutenant governor of the state of Tennessee calls me. Um, I, I, most everybody knows I ran for an open state Senate seat in a special election back in the winter. The election was in March, and I ran as an as an open atheist. I am an open atheist, and everybody knows I'm an atheist. That's what being an open atheist means, and I never hid that. I, of course, I, I didn't base my political campaign on it, but neither did I try to hide it. Um, and as word got out, the lieutenant governor tweeted that in all of his 40 years of his political life that I was the most dangerous woman in Tennessee. So, of course, of course, I've had to take an image of that tweet and make it part of my talk about my campaign because it was uh, – the, the, Tennessee is um, – in their opinion, that was the most dangerous thing of all of the things. And, of course, I ran on a, on a platform of paying teachers more, of expanding Medicaid for our uninsured here in Tennessee, of bringing rural broadband for economic and, and educational equality, all of those terribly, terribly dangerous things. But so, that's obviously, how you're a communist. That's right. That's how the Tennessee opposing party reacted to me. Oh, that's that's great. That that you got to get bumper stickers or a plate or something. I'm kind of proud of it. I've, and actually, in my talk, Phil, I you know, I it's a, it's a it's a joke and it's funny when I put that tweet up. But I conclude my talk by saying, you know, am I really, am I really that dangerous? And then I go through. Well, it depends upon what yeah. you're afraid of. And so, yeah, it's all part of the talk. But yes, it, we we had a we had a pretty good time on that campaign. Oh, I'm 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 envious. I tell you, I. I, I I can hope only someday that I get a moniker such as that. <laughs> I wear it proudly. Yay. Uh, before we get into recovering from religion stuff, I want to do some other things. You're involved with at least one community group around Nashville. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm involved with a couple of groups. Murfreesboro Freethinkers. Murfreesboro is my little small town south of Nashville. And our Freethinkers group is essentially, Phil, it's essentially a meetup group. But we do some other things. We do some little, we do some um, topical discussions and we do some community involvement. We do a lot of socializing uh, in, on our pub night and our drinking skeptically night. And so I'm involved with that. And then, and then I get to be a part of the group of people who every year put on NanoCon, which is the Nashville Nuns Convention, N-O-N-E-S, and that's been uh, just a joy as well. So I'm pretty integrated into this uh, into this secular universe down here in the corner of my world. Well, you have an advantage that I lack. At, at least I lacked it in Champaign-Urbana, and now I lack it in the Chicago suburbs. A lot of people, not everybody, sadly, um, but if you tell them you have an atheist group, they go, meh. Right. It's it's not a big deal. It's kind of like, aren't a lot of people atheists? And why do I have to join your little group? And what would we do when we get together? But when you're in Nashville, 
It's a big deal, right? It's a huge big deal. It's a huge big deal. And we, um, you know, we try to have some crossover events. You know, we try to be visible at our pride events and we try to be visible in our community events and, you know, try to have a, a, a little bit of, um, of, a, of an overlapping Venn diagram with all the other organizations in our town. And so so we, we, tr- we try to do a little bit of that stuff. But, yeah, it's uh, we've we ha- we started in about 2012 and we have over over a thousand members for my little small community. So I think that's pretty remarkable. Now, do I understand correctly? And maybe I'm miss, missing part of the story. So help me out here. The first Nashville nuns nonocon conference was in a school and then it wasn't. And then it was again. Did something mm-hmm. happen in between there? No, no. The I, I actually I think that the year that we had it away from the from the school, it the school simply wasn't available that weekend that we needed it. I don't know if they had another group in or they had a construction project, but we've gone back to that school and that's probably where we'll have it this upcoming year. We have it usually in March and that one year when the school wasn't available, we were able to have it in a very progressive non denominational church building and now we're back at the at the high school where um where we've been meeting for a number of years excellent so nothing from the high school saying we don't want you here we had that experience with other high school venues and some other public schools and you know it's always drama um they're fine they're fine and then they find out who we are and then of course you know you know the usual thing especially here in the south but um but this high school this one particular high school and its administration have been unbelievably accommodating i think that they recognize um, they 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 recognize us for for who and what we are, and so we have had a very good relationship with them. Well, I do know, having gone, I think now twice, uh, it's a fun place. It's it's kind of weird the way the hallway goes, but once you kind of get it down, uh, it's a fun place. And the kitchen facilities and the dinners that you guys have are uh, are hard to beat. It's it's a real <laughs> nice. Uh, it's it's a bigger conference than it than it should be. I. In a way. Right, right. It's a bigger conference than it looks, and it's a nice change of pace from all of the hotel conferences. And I love, I love yeah. our conferences in the in the secular community. I love them all, and they're fun to go to a fancy hotel in a downtown area. Having it at the high school, it gives it a little different flavor. It allows us to keep our expenses way, way down, and so we have, uh, we've kind of fallen in love with it. We've kind of, we like it. We like that it's kind of, um, it's it's kind of a retro high school to begin with. It's not a terribly contemporary high school as far as the building and the facilities, but they're adequate and they allow, to, allow us to keep our prices down. So, and I like the vibe, I, you know, like you said, the, the little, it, it, there's this, um, you know, you have this crazy high school throwback sensation when you walk into the cafeteria <laughs> and you can, yeah. you know, you can kind of put yourself back in there. So it's been, it's been a, a mutually satisfying relationship now for a number of years. So we're real happy with the venue. Well, I was really surprised uh, uh, last, I think it was last year, or this was earlier this year, I had a talk and I, you know, I'm one of the school rooms and you guys run multiple talks at the same time. And I figured because I was talking about investing, I'd have five or six or 10 people there in the room hold 30 or 40. So I gathered some of the chairs around, not a big deal. And people just kept coming in and in and in and we had every seat and I still had like 10 or 12 people standing and they had the most wonderful, brilliant questions about investing. So one of the nice things is that you guys aren't limited to just talking about how stupid religion is, which is perfectly cromulent. Oh, clearly. I'm all for of course, it. that's that's a tribute to you too, Phil. That oh, was a tribute so to sweet. people wanting to hear it. And 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 surprisingly, the NanoCon is a one day conference. We've always done NanoCon official is a one day conference, and we have shoulder events. We have a throwdown on Friday night. Actually, we have it out here at my farm, and then we have an event on Sunday. But NanoCon itself has been a one day event, and I don't know. And because of that, we're able to keep the cost way down it's a big draw for about a two or three hour drive you know per area that's around us and and we've had you know last year we had over 500 attendees so that's some that's as many as some of our big national conferences have so so it's kind of been a um it's kind of been a unique formula and and we've had such success with it that every year when we debrief we think okay now should we expand should we go into a hotel facility and every year we kind of come back to our roots and say no we've had such success with this we've been able to reach out and to present a, a con that 
that people don't get to, you know, when you have these big national cons, the big ones all over in the big cities, people just can't afford the travel and the accommodation. So this allows us to do that on, on, on a local scale. It absolutely does. Have you guys set a date for 2019? I don't think we've set the the confirmed date, but it, but it will be in March. It okay. will be sometime in March. So you're thinking Marchish? I'll make it even mm-hmm. more vague. Mm-hmm. Marchish. When you get an exact date, of course, let me know, and I'll be happy to promote it on the show. Thank you, Phil. I'm so grateful for that. And I, we don't have, you know, we will we will like like most cons do as we make progress and get our speakers and get our lineup. We'd love to share that with you. So I've made a note of that, and I'll be in touch with you as soon as we set that date. Excellent. Now we're going to talk about something that's really fun, but can also sometimes be really serious, recovering from religion. Thank you for that for that opener. Recovering from religion, as most of your listeners know, uh, we've been around for about 10 years. As a matter of fact, starting in January is our 10th anniversary year, and we've got some big things planned for our 10th year that I'll say for just a little bit longer. Um, Dr. Daryl Ray, who, again, most everybody knows, had the vision way back in 2009 of a a place where people could go who needed a little bit of support, who needed a little bit of a few resources, and who needed a little extra time to unpack the baggage that's associated sometimes with doubting and leaving one's faith. And so he had the germ of an idea at a time, and he founded the organization. And now, in these 10 years, we've grown. We're the, you know, we consider ourselves the front line, the portal, so to speak, if there if there is such a thing, for folks who, anywhere on the spectrum of doubt, anywhere from when those, when the ground feels a little soft beneath your feet, figuratively speaking, about your faith and you have some questions that it's it's either not appropriate for you to ask to, at your church or to your fellow churchgoers but they're b- bothering you they're troubling you and so we we consider ourselves a place where people can come ask questions without judgment and when i say ask those questions i mean that quite literally we have a 24 hour telephone hotline it's 184 i doubt it and we also have a 24 hour internet chat um and so we have trained volunteers recovering from religion is an entirely volunteer organization from dr daryl ray to me to our newest trained volunteer we have we call them agents we have them standing by for those telephone calls and those internet chats for folks anywhere on the spectrum of doubt and non-belief. Sometimes we um, are contacted by someone who's just beginning to have an inkling of a doubt, and sometimes we're contacted by folks who may have been an out, an open atheist, but something, some relic or some residual thing from religion has begun to bother them and they have questions about. We have a vast array of resources that we try to provide. We, as I tell people what the helpline is, which is what we call this offering to folks. As I tell folks about the helpline, it's important for me to say, just as important for me to say what it is, is what it is not. We are not a deconversion process. We're very careful to guard that reputation because, as you might expect, we market ourselves to the religious community, and we don't want to have the reputation of people saying to one another, you know, if you call those people, they're just going to create more doubt. They're just going to try to talk you out of their of your religion. We don't we don't do that. We we certainly answer questions. We certainly provide resources. We we provide encouragement. We also have an online community so that after their conversation with a trained agent, we invite them to come into our community where they can talk to people who are on a light journey. So so we try to be the resource for people to go to ask questions, to find information. We encourage critical thinking. We encourage self exploration. We encourage um, speaking with other folks and, and working it through yourself, but we don't try to deconvert people. The other thing that we're not is professional counseling. We don't we don't market ourselves that way. This is entirely peer support. And so um, once we get that out of the way on what we are, then we are, oh, we are wide open to be able to discuss anything that's on the person's mind, anything about any religion, any faith, at any point along the journey. I like it. And just in case the listeners weren't clear, if you want someone to talk you out of religion, recovering from religion is not the place to go. You should call me for that. (laughs) 
or I, me personally. Yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> I, I am, I am not afraid of doing that. And uh, over the years, I've had some people that have come back later and thanked me, and I get to put a another another notch, not my gun, because I'm not a gun person. Another notch in my pencil, <laughs> my, slide, my slide, my slide roll, pencil. my keyboard. But well, uh, and we and we we respect that everybody's process is different, and we don't want you know religion does that religion tries to talk you into believing something and we don't ever want to to feel like we've talked someone into relinquishing their belief system we we have most of us who serve as um on the board and as the trained agents most of us have come out of a religious background and most of us all of us have found that life I, I don't know any other way to say it, Phil. Life is better on this side. And we, are, are, most of us are full of compassion for the struggle and for what that feels like and for the e heavy emotional lifting that one has to go through to get through it. We are aware and sensitive to the trauma that a person could experience due to the fractured relationships that are in the path of leaving religion. We have a compassion for that, but we also want to empower the person to come to these conclusions and decisions on their own. If someone came to us with doubts and we listen and we ref ask some reflective questions and we provide some resources, it is not a failure for us if they don't go, oh, my God, now I see the light and there's no such thing as God and whatever. They this is their journey. This is their process. We're here for a place for them to ask questions, a place for them to get some resources and a place for them to get a little support and encouragement. Absolutely. And I love that. So let me paint a picture. If, uh, if I'm a teenager... And I'm, I'm stuck living at home and my parents drag me to church all the time and they have crazy things going on at church. I'm not saying I'm an atheist, but I think this stuff's terrible and they promote awful things. And I want somebody to talk to is recovering from religion a good place for me to call to just talk it out with somebody. Absolutely. Whether that's a literal telephone call, Phil, or whether that's an internet chat. And it's so funny that that's the, that's the example that you chose to provide because that literal thing is exactly what we have often. And, and you know what's so funny is, you know, when that sometimes happens? Sunday mornings <laughs> when a teenager, <laughs> yeah, right? Because, yeah. And, they're, and they've been able to break from their parents enough that they've chosen not to go to church. Sometimes those chats will come in on a Sunday morning. Of course, we're in every time zone, so you can speculate on where they are because there's complete anonymity. But we get those, when we get those chats that come in, they're exactly what you described. I'm a teenager. I, I'm meeting people at my high school who have different beliefs. I don't share my parents' beliefs anymore, but I'm going, you know, I have I have another couple of years I have to live here and we even encourage our young callers our, our teenagers if they are going to be dependent upon their parents for their college education then we tell them you know really it's in your best interest to remain in this limbo area where you don't have to come out to your parents quite yet because if you're if your education depends on this if you can hang on for a little bit longer it will be to your benefit to be able to do that it's a tough situation and it's a yeah. tough call that our agents sometimes have to make well, Mate. and I don't know, you know, I, I probably agree philosophically the same, but I'm going to speak for myself here for a minute. If you're an atheist and you can come out and you can be out and you suffer no harm or no consequences from it, I think you kind of owe it to other atheists to come out. However, hmm. if you're living off someone else's dime or you're not considered an adult by the people around you, wh whatever age that may be. Or if your safety is in some kind of uh, peril, if you come out, you have no obligation whatsoever to other atheists, to yourself, or to your family. You don't have to put yourself out there for trouble and hassle that you're not ready for. Just wait Phil, it out. Uh, what, a, um, what a perfect intersection of, your, of the two halves of your life, the financial part and the part where you recognize and you try to help people understand, you know, it matters. We live in a capitalist society. Money is everything. You know, you've got to have it to survive. So, so that's that half. And then the other half is, is being an atheist yourself and recognizing and seeing how much – uh, stronger we are when we see the world for what it is, how much fuller our lives are, are for being driven and led by science and reason. And that 
that statement that you just said is the perfect example of those two parts of it. And yes, we find that. And, I, and we empower our agents to have to make that tough call when they're speaking with someone who is in turmoil and, 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 and is in a, uh, they might even be in an isolated place. And yet, if they are financially dependent and they're not ready to take that step out, we say the same thing, which also, which also gives us all the more reason to encourage our folks, if you can, do, because there's some folks who can't. And they and they need they need the ones of us who can to sort of carry that burden for the time being so that we can become more visible and more seen and more vocal for those folks who are in a situation where they can't. Wait, another weird, I guess, example or comparison. I never could have imagined the success that I have in my business by marketing to atheists. It's actually staggering and blows me away almost every day. I have talked to other financial advisors and tried to set up arrangements where I could refer clients to them to get good quality service and I could help more people through my podcast and through my communications and connections with those people, helping them connect to a financial advisor that I at least know a little bit of something about and and feel comfortable with them. What a what a statement that is. Well, I'm, and, you and I, this. I'm delighted to hear that. You got to hear the second half, though. So far... And I've done this three or four times. At some point, the other advisor goes, where are all these people coming from? <laughs> because most financial advisors have to struggle very mightily and spend advertising dollars almost always locally. Most financial advisors are local, but yet I'm bringing in people from all over the country. And they go, where are all these people coming from? And I go, oh, I, I, I just happen to have this podcast. And they go, oh, what do you talk about on your podcast? And I can't build a relationship by lying to them. So I tell them what it is and they go, so a lot of your clients are atheists and like, yeah. And they're like, you know, I'm actually pretty good right now. I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm full myself. I mean, I, I don't really need new business. And I'm like, it's, it's like I'm handing you customers and they say, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want them atheist type people. And I was like, even when it comes to money, it, money is not enough of a motivation to a greedy person to have a, a atheist as a client. It, it's wow. kind of bizarre to me. I think I have a solution to that problem that I'm working on, which I'll announce probably in a few weeks to a few months. But I've had this happen multiple times now that people just, no, uh, I'd rather struggle than take on a bunch of atheists. Goodness sakes. Yeah. It's still, a str you know, I, I had that experience in my campaign. It's still su such a struggle to be recognized. And, and, and of course, the ironic twist to all of that is that I feel like not, not all atheists, and we've got to move past just being atheist into our whole humanism, but I feel like we, it's not that we always act on it, but we have access to a to a higher moral calling because because our morality resides within. It's sort of like the difference when you raise a child. It's a difference between the child behaving because they don't want, they don't want you to get they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to experience a punishment from mom and dad and then they internalize what's right and wrong. And that's our goal as parents is to is to get our children to understand in the beginning we have to we have to accompany that with discipline and sometimes even punishment if they do a bad thing because that's our job and we're trying to get them to do that. But the goal is to get them to internalize, oh, this is a you know, if I were to take someone else's belongings, that's a bad thing and I feel I can feel what kind of pain they would experience if I do that. Well, the same is true about our about our own morality, and so, and yet, and yet we get put, you know, over and over down at the bottom of people who other people trust because of that. And and when the irony is, we have this we have this access to a higher morality because we have to we have to confront ourselves and we have to confront our own conscience when we do something that we don't that we know is not the right thing to do. Absolutely. Uh, can you give me that number one more time, please? The number for the hotline, which is part of the telephone portion of our helpline, is 1-84-I-DOUBT-IT, with doubt, D-O-U-B-T, 1-84-I-DOUBT-IT. I, I thank you for spelling that, because I, I, I can't do that kind of magic. <laughs> uh, now, you've said, and you, you led right into where I wanted to go next, that this phone number is part of the thing. What's with this chat thingy? What is that all about? Mm -hmm. 
That's an internet chat, and that is uh, so. You know, when you go to your, if you do online banking, or if you do, uh, if you contact your cable company, whatever it is, you'll see a chat bubble appear on the home page, and they'll connect you to a customer service agent. Who it's anybody's guess on whether you choose to do that or a, or, a, or a telephone call, which is which is better, or maybe I should say in the customer service area, which is worse. But that there's a there's an, a live internet chat, and you're working with a customer service agent. Well, if you go to recoveringforreligion.org, on every page of our website, you'll see a little green chat bubble in the lower right corner of the screen. Or if you have it on a mobile, it'll be, you know, somewhere on your telephone screen. And if you click on that little green chat bubble, there'll be an agent standing by. We we market ourselves as 24 hours because we have agents all over the world in other time zones. And so we simply say we're open 24 hours. And so you can begin a chat. You have you, the client, would have complete anonymity. You can share as much or as little about yourself as you would like to. You can share no details except for whatever it takes to get uh, the agent to understand what your circumstances are, and that is a is is a live chat with a trained agent who will help guide you in the direction of whatever it is that's troubling you, whatever it is you want to talk about, and that's what our internet chat is. And Phil. We opened this chat about a year ago, year and a half ago. We started with a telephone hotline, and we noticed that there was the struggle for some people on the telephone chat, the telephone hotline was sometimes on a telephone call, it's hard to carve out enough privacy. You were afraid a child or a coworker might walk in on you. So we thought, you know, we could provide, if we could provide an internet chat, that would give them one more avenue to be able to reach us. And what we didn't quite realize that sort of came as a surprise to us after we got it all, our telephone system was a U.S. based system. And when we opened our internet chat, it opened us to the world. And so recovering from religion is global. Anywhere anyone has internet access, they go to recoveringfromreligion.org and they there's the green chat bubble, and they can start a chat across the globe with a trained agent who's standing by and waiting to help. Well, that that is delightful. Now, of course, I'm assuming you guys would take some money if people uh, were listening and wanted to give you a few bucks. How, how does that we work? We would take that. We would take that. We operate uh, on a pretty lean budget because we're you know we're able to keep our costs down. We are a 100 percent volunteer organization. No one's taking a salary, and as I said, our operating budget is as lean, about as lean as we can get it. We have some some things in the works for the future that we're hoping to. Um, we're not quite ready to make an announcement about that yet, but we depend upon the donations and the support of people who share our vision, who. Share share our dream that there needs to be a resource for folks to reach out to as they begin the journey away from and through their doubting of religion. And so there's a donate tab on our website. It's recoveringfromreligion.org. You can tap on that donate button. And as you can expect, any amount goes a long way because we have so little overhead because we operate on such a lean budget. And we're grateful for every bit of contribution that anybody can make and partner with us as we try to to be the go-to organization for folks as they go through this sometimes seismic and arduous journey. Absolutely. And I'm looking at the donate page and you can even use the Amazon smile function and it costs, ah, yes. costs you nothing. Just when you shop, you give money to recovering from religion. That's fabulous. Thank you for mentioning it, Phil. You're a better executive director for our far than I. <laughs> I get paid the same too. <laughs> Now, yes, you can use you can certainly use Smile, um, and and we always try to promote that. And if if you don't know what the Smile program is, you can designate a nonprofit as you shop at Amazon. It doesn't change any of the price for you. It's just a feature that Amazon offers. If you'll designate Recovering from Religion as your charitable organization, then every time you shop at Amazon, and as I said, your prices don't increase, but Recovering from Religion gets a little a little kiss from that, and that would be awesome. Also, because because we're a 501c3, there are a lot of employers that will do some kind of a, uh, you know, a charitable match or a charitable contribution. So if you'll look into that, if you're not all, you know, I know there's a lot of demand on on folks's um, charitable contributions, and I respect that. But if you haven't found a place to channel that, Recovering from Religion is a is a wonderful organization to be able to support because we provide such a necessary service. And I appreciate you thinking about that, Phil. Not a problem. Now, I also see support groups. What What does that mean? Is that like in person, on the yes, phone, yes. both? Yes. Yes. 
That's another feature that we have. As I said, we have a a telephone hotline. We have an Internet chat line. We have an online community, and we have our local support groups. Our local support groups, um, uh, as they they sound like, are our local in-person sit around the table, talk it through support groups. We, We have an interested volunteer in a community. That person comes in as a volunteer. That person receives training from us on how group dynamics work and what peer support is and then they set we we um, underwrite the cost of their meetup page and they find a place in their community to, oftentimes a library conference room and they set their meeting times and they have according to their group's uh, personality and dynamics they have meetings sometimes once a month sometimes twice a month this is a support group this is a real live it's almost an extension of our of our hotline and our helpline it's it's real life real time support Support groups. I happen to lead the one that's in my community in Murfreesboro. We met yesterday and our question, our topic, we had a good crowd that attended and our topic was what, what is something that is standing in your way that's religion, maybe religion related that's keeping you from being as happy and healthy and productive as you'd like to be. And the discussion was the discussion and the ensuing support from one another from these peers was just wonderful. So we do have that. There's a tab at our homepage where you can find if number one, whether there's already an established recovering from religion local support group in your area or whether or not you'd like to you would like to lead that, you can start the volunteer process, we'll provide the training, we'll provide the meetup site, and get you started on that. So that's what our local support groups are. Wow, just so much. Uh, Anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Our online community, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier what the helpline does not do. We don't deconvert. Um, and our agents are trained. We don't do any self-disclosure on the phone call. And that seems, um, it, it's, it may seem kind of, why would we do that? It may seem hard to understand in the beginning, but it's because we want the focus to be on the client. And it's too tempting, maybe, for those of us who are trained agents to want to tell our story. First of all, most of us have gone through it and we're out the other side and we want to encourage someone and say, you know, I've been there and it feels so good and now I'm out and it's all good. And we want to, we want, we don't want to quite do that because as I said, we don't want to do that. We don't want to dominate the conversation and we, that person needs to be free to do his or her own journey. But you can expect that a client will have a need. They want that. They want to hear from someone who's been there and come out the other side. So after a call or a chat with our agent, we offer the opportunity for that client to come inside. I know I'm using figurative language here, but we offer them the opportunity to come inside of our online support community. And once they get into into that community, they self-select the little subgroups to which they may want to be a part of. We have Baptist, Catholic, Christian, LGBT, military, Mormon, Muslim, whatever it is, you can be as a part of as many of those communities you would as you would like to, and it's in there. It's in those subgroups that they're able to meet with other folks who are on a similar journey, sometimes farther along and sometimes farther behind. And it's in there that they share their personal stories. You know, uh, each of those subgroups has a language and a context all unique to itself. And so if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, I may not I may not get all that language. I don't have that experience. But inside that channel, so to speak, that subgroup, they're able to talk with other folks who understand the language, who understand the experience. And so our online community is is yet a, a deeper dive for folks that need a little bit more support. And this is especially good for our folks who are isolated and not yet out. I like it. I like it. Well, Gail, thank you so much for spending time with us here on the Phil Ferguson Show and telling us all about you and, of course, recovering from religion. Phil, thank you. And thank you for your ongoing and continuous support of recovering from religion. We're so grateful for your support. Thank you. You mind spending 30 seconds on dark matter just for the heck of it? So when we observe galaxies... We find that they're spinning around at such a rate that stars on the edge should be flung outward, sort of like water droplets on a bicycle wheel that's spinning fast, the water gets flung out. But the stars aren't getting flung out. Something must be holding them in. 
We don't see anything that can do that, but we know gravity has the power to hold things together. So we imagine that maybe there's some matter out there that we don't see, dark matter. That's why we don't see it. It doesn't give off light. And that matter is exerting a gravitational pull, holding those stars together in these spinning galaxies. And when we make that hypothesis, it explains observations so spectacularly well that we begin to gain confidence that maybe the stuff that we haven't yet seen and we haven't yet touched or smelled yet, maybe it's real. So we build big detectors and we try to capture one of these dark matter particles. We haven't succeeded yet, but I think that we will. So this is a beautiful example of how observations drive rational thinking to explain the facts and ultimately verify it through observation and experiment that can be replicated. That is what science is. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Well, I do hope you enjoyed the interview with Gail Jordan as much as I did. And I think that Recovering from Religion is a very important organization. Uh, so if you feel it in your heart to give a few bucks, yeah, you know, do a little Google search and donate some money. And we're just about in the last days of the fundraiser for the Secular Student Alliance, where... I will be on the hook for up to $10,000. Hopefully next show I will have the results and we'll find out if you get the show right away. Because, I mean, there's really only a day or two left in September. The uh, promotion ends at the end of September. So after October 1st, you'll have to give your money somewhere else. Well, actually, you can still give money to the Secular Student Alliance. I'm just not going to match it anymore. Uh, hopefully next show. I'll have those totals and we can go over that. Uh, real quick, a couple of uh, updates in, I think, about three weeks. Oh, I have to check the date. I will be in Las Vegas. Uh, the Center for Inquiry will have their convention in Las Vegas, and I'm looking greatly forward to that. And then a couple weeks after that, I will be in San Francisco for the Freedom From Religion Foundation conference. So looking forward to a wonderful fall conference season. If you are putting on a local or regional conference or you're organizing some conference and you would like to have me talk about it on the show, perhaps you or someone you know would like to come on the show and talk about where it is and when it is and who you're having speak, let me know. Of course, my email, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. I would be happy to promote it. And of course, if you need a speaker, Perhaps we can arrange something for me to come and visit and talk about something. Who knows? Well, we can work on that. A couple of quick reviews in my little absence. Uh, as you probably heard from the very beginning of the show, I spent a few weeks in Italy. So I missed a couple of reviews. Uh, here we have uh, one from Gideon. I first, heard to, uh, I first heard Phil talk at Lehigh Valley Humanists. I have enjoyed every episode since. Thank you so much, Gideon. Uh, the next one is Butcher of Texas, another five-star review. Phil is a great educator. I love his show. He patiently explains financial investment strategies and answers questions over and over again on his show in a way that is accessible to people with no background in finance. It took me a few months, but now I am much more comfortable with my future retirement. I could not have understood the financial mumbo-jumbo without his podcast. He backs his arguments with facts, and most importantly... He warns listeners about pitfalls. The often funny atheist part is the cherry on top for me. Well, thank you, Butcher of Texas. I greatly appreciate it. Another thing that's kind of really striking me today, and, and I don't know if any of you ever have this, if you've gone to a secular convention. Matter of fact, almost any convention of any time, you have that excitement of hundreds and sometimes thousands and uh, really big conferences, tens of thousands of people, and... You stay up too late, you you get up too early, maybe you drink a little too much, um, but you have a great time, and then it's over, and you've got to go back to the normal world. Well, I kind of feel like that now with my trip to Italy. Now, the nice thing is I really like my job. I love making the podcasts. I love talking to all my clients, but sometimes it gets a little busy, and I spend a whole lot of time doing work, work that I enjoy, but... I can kind of feel that little post-Italy kind of, I don't know, melancholy, malaise. I, I don't know. There's no one around to speak Italian with where before every day when I walked out of my hotel, anyone 
almost anyone, uh, could and would speak with me in Italian. And the vast majority of the people were so kind about it and and entertained me and uh, uh, or at least entertained my efforts in speaking Italian. It was so much fun and so much joy. And, and I look forward to going there and or somewhere else again uh, in the future. But uh, it's kind of hitting me at the same time that fall has come to uh, Chicagoland, to Illinois. Uh, those of you who haven't gone somewhere for a month, you got to see everything in between, but we've gone from the stupidly painful, hot and humid summer to suddenly I get back to Illinois and I drive and the fields are all golden brown. And it's a sign that the heat is breaking. The heat is gone, at least the extreme heat. Uh, you can still get some warm days, but the, sum, uh, the summer is over. The heat is going away, which is nice, and we get better temperatures, and we get all the colors of fall, but it also means that the cold is coming, <laughs> and it was one of the things that I, when I travel, I used to ask people, you know, how, what's it like here in the winter, and no matter where you go, unless maybe you're near the equator, uh, if they have seasons, they always go, it's so cold here, it's so cold here, <laughs> um, and I started doing this thing when we were in the city of Genoa. And I would say, how cold is it here? And they would tell me it's so, so cold. And I finally came up with this uh, different way of asking the question. How many days in a year is the temperature below freezing? Because everyone knows freezing, even if it's Fahrenheit or Celsius. And how many days below freezing? And people in and around Genoa would say, easily three or four days. (laughs) So... Three or four times a year, your temperature would fall below freezing. And they're like, yes, very, very cold here. And then I would have to explain to them what it's like in Chicago in the winter. And uh, they they all decided, every single one of them, that they would never move to a place like Chicago. But, of course, if I talk to somebody in North Dakota or perhaps uh, away from the coast in Alaska or in northern Poland you're going to get a very different answer. They, they would still tell you very cold, but the number of days below freezing, I think, is a much better indicator. Um, the other one that goes with that, uh, as I, I'll ask people, how many inches of snow does it take for uh, the local officials to cancel school? And if you're somewhere like I was in Arkansas, one inch, man, <laughs> one inch, school might be closed for a couple of days. And it probably was a good reason, good idea, because they had no salt, they had no soot, they had no grit, they had no plows, and the snow would just get packed and turn into ice on the roads. It was literally very dangerous. But you go up to some place like Green Bay, Wisconsin, and they go, eh, a couple of feet, <laughs> a couple of feet, and we might cancel school. Maybe a few people can't make it to school, but we're not going to cancel it. So it, it's uh, just kind of a, another way of looking at things. But anyway, I'm prattling on just, you know, I'm kind of at this inflection point where I'm recovering uh, from uh, people speaking Italian to me every day to no one speaking Italian and kind of getting back settled into work and realizing it's fall and the cold is coming. So uh, I hope to see some of you soon in Las Vegas or San Francisco. If you do see me, please feel free to stop by and say hello. I'd love to talk to you. And of course, if you have show topic ideas, I have a big list, but I'm always looking for even better ideas. You can email me, Phil at Polaris Financial Planning. Until I see you in person or the next show, ciao.